What's up? Hi bites. Yeah. Talk <laughs> Python. <laughs> and some random other guy. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so, okay, finally the promised like, video interviews are happening and um, this is my friend uh, Anthony Shaw here. He's the uh, director of learning and innovation at yeah. Dimension Data. So it's actually a huge company. Like you guys are like how many thousands? 30,000 people. Which is nuts. It's like a small country or town. Yes, yeah, we're spread all over the world. It's uh, in 49 countries across everywhere. So yeah, it's yeah. a pretty big spread. That's pretty crazy. And you're also yeah. a plural site. Uh, Python course author, right? Yeah, so I published my first course uh, earlier this year, which was moving from Python 2 to Python 3. And then I'm just about to publish my second course, which is what's new in Python 3.7, hopefully in time for when Python 3.7 is actually released. <laughs> so yes. the two things should be released together. So if you want to learn about 3.7, then um, follow any of the stuff either I've been publishing, uh, quite a lot of blog articles over the last couple of months on 3.7 features and stuff. Um, as well as the course, yeah. And I think that's a great topic, like especially with you know legacy Python sort of now getting close to where it's just not going to be officially supported. That's uh, yeah. sort of the last call to, for people to get on Python three. But okay, so actually, what we wanted to talk about, um, what we wanted to talk about in this in this video is uh, just some of the questions that that you guys uh, sent either over Twitter or like in YouTube comments. And um, so I guess what should we start out with? Like what we were going to talk about is. How do you create larger Python projects? How do you how do you manage them? And uh, I was really excited to ask you that question because you're one of the the authors or contributors to the uh, Salt Stack project, which yeah. is a huge Python project. Maybe you can talk a little bit about like what it is, what it's about. Yeah, I'm probably like the fiftieth biggest contributor, so I'm not even in the top league. Right. But it's the Salt Stack project and the Stackstorm project. Both are huge code bases, um, and really both of them. I think have a few approaches for basically what happens when it's all about the team and how big the team becomes. It's not necessarily about how much code you have. So typically when you have a lot of code, you've got a lot of developers. Now, a lot of the problems you actually have to resolve in the application are more about the team structure, communication and processes and how they work with each other, less than about the actual technical problems. So you end up basically building technical solutions to people problems. And those people problems right. are, you've got one team working on the front end, for example, or one team working on maybe how the application interfaces with another API, um, and they want to release um, different features individually or toggle things on and toggle things off. And this is really kind of this style where you've got uh, multiple services and multiple packages that make up an application. Mm -hmm. So as an application gets bigger and bigger, it basically becomes an ecosystem of lots of smaller applications. Now, modern terminology, I guess, refers to this as microservices, which is a separate topic, but um, really the principles are quite similar, which is that you've got, basically, you're deploying lots of smaller applications individually. Now, what you then need to figure out is... So is this sort of like the old, uh, well, how do you eat an elephant? Yeah. It's like one bite at a time. You, you, yeah. you divide and conquer that problem. And um, I, I also wanted to follow up, like, like you were saying, the, the project structure matches the organizational structure? Is that, is that what, what you were saying? Like, I, I got, I got yeah. the sense like that was... Um, I, I, different teams have done it different ways. I've, I've yeah. seen, I mean, there's a joke that micro, you basically have a microservice for each team. Yeah. Um, and it's each team that doesn't talk to each other has their own microservice. Yeah. It's not normally it's not really that bad, but um, yeah, in large applications, then definitely... You, you want a team to be working on sort of a releasable application, a releasable component mm -hmm. by themselves. Um, and if you're working in an Agile Scrum methodology, that's typically how you would do it. So right. that, that team, that Scrum basically gets together and they can release that part of the application. But if you're building, I don't know, something like as big as Instagram, for example, it's not like they're one, over there, like we can see them. Yeah, it's not like it's their booth, there's not it? like a daily stand up with like, you know, 300 developers standing yeah. in a big circle. Oh, yeah. Like they've obviously got to split that up and isolate those teams so they can't interfere with each other. Mm. So like if one team breaks part of the application or they want to make some really fundamental change to the architecture or the database or whatever it is, then you don't want that to impact another team who's working on I don't know, the new ad serving component right. or whatever. Yeah. So you want to be able to like parallelize these changes yeah. so that you can leverage all the developers that you have and they're not like working this big long chain where everybody's like blocking each other from, from making yeah. progress. Yeah. 
So large, really large applications really become about isolation. That's kind of the main theme, yeah. I guess, is how things can be isolated from one another so it's not disruptive. Um, and so how did you break, in, or like how did you start contributing to this project and how, how big was it when you got started? Because, I mean, this is like, this is like an insanely huge project. Like just to get, like, what, what could we say to give people a sense of like the scale of this? It's uh, yes, uh, hundreds of contributors. Yeah, over a thousand contributors. Yeah. Um, spanning across um, thousands of modules. Yeah, yeah. Um, which and each module could talk to a different system or a different API. Yeah. It it does so many different things. Uh, this is SolStack. Uh, StackStorm is quite similar in that it's a very broad-reaching application. It touches on all sorts of manner of things you might want yeah. to interact with. So they're both DevOps tools, um, yeah. which becomes complicated because you're basically interfacing with different systems. Uh, how to get into it is like. Same as the elephant, right? You you basically try and bite off Make a little hole, like, <laughs> like Ace Ventura. Um, oh, he's getting out of the elephant. The my, rail. <laughs> my favorite technique is to uh, start off testing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, soft stack some of the areas of the application that I wanted to work on the actual core code. Right. What I would do first is raise a pull request with some new tests, because if you can understand how the how to test something to ensure that it works, then you probably can understand enough of it to actually go and change it. Right. And also, if you don't know how it works, you probably shouldn't be changing it in the first place. So writing unit tests or integration tests yeah. is actually a really easy way to get started in a project. Also, building a trust. You build a trust with the yeah. open source maintainers. Yeah. Um, so you can say to them, look, I take testing seriously. Here's my code style, here's my code quality. And then once you've kind of done that, then it's easier to then go and jump in and start making yeah. improvements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, very, very interesting. I, I think it's uh, it's it's very cool to you know, hear about your experience because it, it is such a big project and it is uh, also like I think like commercially a pretty successful project. Or like, yeah. I'm not sure if that's the right sort of way to put it, but it it is used a lot in a commercial context and people are getting paid to work on on that particular project. Right? Yeah, um, Adobe. Creative Cloud runs on uh, Solstack and uh, yeah. LinkedIn as well. The infrastructure yeah. does, yeah. which is pretty amazing. That yeah, it's like still it's all like tens of thousands of servers. And, yeah, yeah, and, and just the thought that you know you could be sitting, like when you when you committed like the first uh, uh, you know sent them your first like change set or patch, like where where were you working from home? Like where where were you at the time? Right? Like were, were you connected with that with that community in some way, or were you just like? Um, I'm gonna get into this. I, I <laughs> like this. Yeah, I want to work on this. Or? Yeah, I, I think it's just, I looked at the software, really liked the structure, what they'd done, and could see some gaps, I guess, in functionality yeah. that were in my area of expertise, which was around like cloud APIs and provisioning. So I was like, I can help here, um, and then basically just started off making some small changes, yeah. uh, particularly around testing and documentation, because those are nice, easy ones to get yeah. started. Everybody with. loves that, right? So yeah. Like, oh, Thank God, like there's they, someone yeah. who's taking care of that. Um, and then kind of breached out from there. And you know, the, the team, both of those teams are really, really receptive to external people coming in and making contributions to the project. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all really friendly, really welcoming. The code review process was really straightforward. Nice. They gave really constructive comments. Um, you know, I had to make changes and things like that, but you, you should expect that. I think if you're going into an open source project for the first time, especially if you're not familiar with their code styles and their approach. So um, yeah, just be open-minded, be polite, I would say as well, and that helps. Yeah. Um, you know, this is somebody else's house yeah. typically you're walking into, so um, yeah, be willing to make adaptions to your code. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great analogy, yeah. right? Where it's like, you don't, you're not just walking into somebody's living room, start rearranging the furniture, yeah. but it's like, you say hi first, like you ring the doorbell and, yeah. and you just sort of become a part of that project organically and yeah. build that trust. Yeah, yeah, no, very cool. Um, I'm gonna hit the stop button here because I don't wanna screw up the recording. All right, next question. So this one is from uh, Dhruv Patak on Twitter. And the question was basically about um, how do you go from Python apprentice to Python expert? So I guess this is about when okay. you're, you know enough about Python to be dangerous with it. Like, I feel like as an apprentice, you'd be a little bit after the beginner stage, mm. at least in my sort of interpretation of that. And then how do you go from, from that sort of intermediate Hi. stage to actually being an expert? Oh, hey, we have <laughs> but not a, no worries, man. Yeah, we're just trying to record uh, like a video for, but. Uh,
Hey folks, so um, this is Louis. We just met here at the, uh, the exhibit hall at PyCon. And Louis is a first time attendee at PyCon, right? Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Because when, when you do that, when it's your first time at PyCon, you get this, uh, can, can you show the badge thing again? You get this like little uh, tag on your badge that says uh, first time attendee. So I thought it was the perfect opportunity to ask you, Louis, like, why, um, why'd you come to PyCon? Like, why, why come here? Why is it a good idea or not a good idea? And um, why would you come here? Yeah, I, come, I came from Nicaragua. Uh, I traveled for seven hours to get here. And I'm really excited of being here because uh, I'm learning a lot of, of very nice people, a lot of experts, and they're sharing their knowledge. So I'm really excited to be here. That's and it. I'm meeting some interesting people like this guy that I follow his blog, but now I meet him in person. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's really nice okay. meeting you too. And uh, so I, somebody actually left a comment and said, um, well, I could just, you know, meet these people over the internet. Like, I, I don't know, you could send someone an email or like send them a Twitter tweet. Like, why, why actually go and like meet people in, in person? Well, it, it's really nice to shake hands, first of all. Um, where you get a closer relationship uh, uh, when you meet the people in person. So, and um, also you feel all the all the energy that these people is is giving and how they share their knowledge. So that's really great. Nice. Yeah, I think that that's a good answer. I think it's it's such a, such a huge difference when you actually go and meet in person, right? And it's uh, yeah, you, you just have a much stronger connection that way with people and much quicker. Uh, well, thanks, Louis. Thanks to you.